it's a pleasure to be here, and um, it's a pleasure for me to, to meet Melba and Lee. And I've known uh, and, and known Tom for a long time, and admired um, all the good work that he's done at DuPont and the support he's given to our association. And a couple of things that I would note. First, the legal market generally, or the legal profession, strikes me as it's becoming very bifurcated. I can talk to you about the corporate side of things and trying to serve the corporate community. Obviously, there's a market, the individual, uh, and how um, individuals are served. Uh, and the, the needs of uh, individuals, and they're clearly, uh, in our society today, there's a lot of unmet um, uh, legal needs. And so how you, uh, it, and it strikes me that the concerns that we have uh, in many ways and the skills and some of the things that are going to be, we're going to be talking about, don't exactly apply there. So it strikes me you have a bit of a challenge in how you're going to train people to, to go into two different areas, I don't know how to describe them, but sort of two different camps. Uh, but I do think they're very different. However, it is important for you to know where you're going. Um, you know, Yogi Berra said, if you don't know where you're going, you might wind up someplace else. And um, so where are you going? Well, I'm not so sure necessarily that I can tell you where, uh, where you should go, but I can talk to you a little bit about uh, the in-house legal community and talk to you a little bit about what they see. And uh, I've had the privilege of working with and observing that community for 20 years. And there's been a tremendous amount of change over that time. And I just came from the ACC annual meeting. And as Gardner noted, we had over 2,000 in-house counsel at that meeting. We had 130 exhibitors who paid $25,000 each to be there. Um, as well as over 120 program sessions and, and um, attorneys from 25 countries. And so it was quite a gathering. And as I listened, observed, and talked, I, I just tried to absorb it because for the first time I was in a position of, uh, I didn't have any particular responsibility since I stepped down as president this past June. And I got to kind of wander around, listen, and and uh, without the attendant uh, responsibilities that I normally would have had. A couple of things that I would say to you, though. Number one, um, the sessions that had value in their title pretty much were all sold out. And these were sessions on um, things like alternative fee arrangements in uh, transactional activities, alternative or fixed fees in uh, litigation, um, what you learn in the life cycle of an LPO, uh, any, anything, um, uh, again, related to different ways of doing business with your law firm or alternative providers of legal services from, uh, from the traditional law firm. And those shows, uh, sessions, were all packed. Uh, and uh, we launched the ACC Value Challenge about three years ago. And what we said was that the purpose of that was to reconnect cost and value in the delivery of legal services. Essentially three things we'd like to see. One, reduce costs. Two, predictability. So there is some understanding uh, and some um, ability uh, to predict and to budget for uh, uh, legal costs and legal services. And the third was to improve outcomes. And that might be the actual outcome of the, the uh, uh, particular matter, or more significantly, outcomes in the sense of helping to change behaviors. So if you have a large number of um, uh, employ employment lawsuits, that you do something to bring those down and change how, uh, help and change how things are done. So the clients are demanding value, and they're looking at ways to achieve this. The, what I would also say to you is I could give you any number of rules, uh, procedures or uh, different statements about what constitutes value or ways that you should go, but I would say that the clients in the in-house community and clients are not monolithic. And virtually anything I tell you is a truism, I could also go out and find exceptions or something on the other side. And so I think as we talk about this, I have to take it all with a grain of salt. I would say that uh, our members are uh, moving away from 
uh, the large, what is in the, in the ma uh, media referred to as big law. They are moving away from those law firms. They're too expensive, they, except for certain matters, but they're moving away from them in, um, you know, you have bet the company in strategic matters, and every firm thinks that's what they do. And I would say to you, and Tom is much better at this than I am, but I'm willing to bet it's five to 10% of whatever work is done is bet the company in strategic. The rest of it is very important, but it's transactional, operational type of work. And there are other ways to get that work done than um, the traditional law firms, unless the traditional law firms change how they're doing business. Um, and that model is under tremendous pressure. And so where's the pressure coming from? Well, uh, the LPOs, the legal process outsourcers, the alternative providers like Axiom and uh, some of those, uh, boutique law firms that are spin-offs off of the uh, AMLAW 200 firms. Uh, there's a variety of new providers that are, uh, that, are, that are out there and they're going to provide um, more uh, service of more value to the, uh, to the clients. And, uh, and I think any firm that is not paying attention to this and not looking at how they are going about to going to change is going to be in serious trouble. And uh, I know I talk to um, firms and they say, well, we propose alternative fees and our clients don't want them and they don't. Well, I will say a certain portion of the problem is within the in-house community and is in the client um, area and that, that they have not. They've been slow to move or to adopt uh, to some of the changes, but that is happening as well. And all of our numbers, the surveys that we do and others show an increased percentage of, of uh, clients moving in this direction and exploring and looking for new ways of doing business. And the reason is very simple. They're all under serious economic, or virtually all of them are under serious economic stress. And it will continue to be uh, that way. And the also, also, the other factor is, is within their company, Virtually any other portion of, the, um, uh, of a company uh, has had to change how they do business. Uh, and there's, you know, you have procure procurement and technology and you have all these different changes in business models, the pressures to change, all of that's happening. And again, Tom can speak to that much better than I can. But it's all happening. And wh what makes you think that the law uh, department is going to be any different? And I would say, and maybe Lee will speak to this, but I would say, to look at the journalism uh, community and, and the, the media community, and look what technology has done to it. If you think 10 years ago or 15 years ago when you were reading papers and you had magazines and that, now we all have these things, or variations of an iPad or something like that. Of course, I find it ironic, because all of us are up here and our actual notes are things <laughs> like this. Um, but that's, you know, that's for another day. <laughs> so the last thing that I would say, and, and I'm, um, Gardner said to keep this to 10 minutes, which is, believe me, quite difficult, uh, given that it, um, in, in each of these areas, I, I know all of us could talk for a substantially longer period of time. The last thing that I would mention is, um, since I um, stepped down uh, from ACC, I've uh, become what many of you do. I'm now a consultant. And so as I do this, um, I'm doing some work for ACC and I'm doing some work for some law firms and some vendors and, and, and things like that. But one of the firms that I've connected with and am doing some work with is a very, it's, it's a very interesting firm because they have a totally different business model. And they, are, um, they have set themselves up as a model for the things that we were talking about in the ACC value challenge about using technology about eliminating partner and, and leveraging, uh, about knowledge and metrics, knowledge sharing and knowledge management, and using metrics uh, and fixed fee arrangements and things. And I've, um, it's, it's very interesting to me because I feel there's a, a huge potential for firms that are setting themselves up like this, and they don't have any of the legacy issues that the big, big law firms do. They, they can develop a um, software package and a, a, a proprietary ecosystem that allows them to do what firms talk about doing, that's collaborate and share, but which very few actually do very well. And, and I, uh, I think that the legal community itself 
is slow to change and it is hard to drive change. Uh, I think Richard Susskind said, it's hard to convince somebody that's making a million dollars a year that there's something wrong with his or her business model. Uh, and that's what you see with a lot of law firms. And so I think these new firms or new alternative delivery um, mechanisms for legal services are going to become very, very significant. And as a result of that, it strikes me that the people coming out of law school, there's a couple of things going on. Are they going to have the right sorts of skills, number one? And number two, are they going to get the right types of training? Because to date, at least, the training has come essentially through the law firms as they uh, and that's where they make some of their money, too, through the leveraging and the use of the, the, uh, the young associates. Uh, but more and more uh, uh, companies are refusing to pay for first and second and sometimes even third year, but certainly first and second year associates on, on their work. They won't pay for it. So I think you have two issues that you're going to have to address. One is, are you teaching the right sets of skills, which is for a whole nother um, conversation, but bluntly from my perspective you're not. Um, and then uh, secondly, even how far and what do you do with those folks when they come out, because your assumption is, is you bring them out and they're not ready to be lawyers. And the market is changing, and the market that has turned them into lawyers, or the, the, the process that has turned them into lawyers, is having to shift because of the market. And so there are two challenges going on there, and I'm trying to stick to 10 minutes, and I think I went over a little bit, but I'll stop at that and turn it over Good. to my panelists. Melba, tell us uh, what part of this you see and what some of the issues are that you have to deal with. Sure, but I have a story to tell about you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I need a lawyer. <laughs> and it's on tape. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chad. Um, when Gardner called to ask me to participate on this panel, I said to him, no, 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 no. What you need is somebody who understands the whole OCI, summer associate, entry level hiring process. That's not me. Knowing full well that I have never, and I mean never, won an argument with Gardner, have you? Um, I said, okay, I I'll do it. He said, we need your perspective. You're in the trenches every day. Um, when he said that, my first thought was, this is no trench. This is a deep black hole. The good news is that I believe that the storm has passed as it relates to employment of lawyers. I believe that the reset button has been um, pressed. Expectations are different now. Um, and people are beginning to think through how they can solve the problems. I felt like a couple of years ago, people were stuck. Um, they didn't know how to change. The status quo, they wanted to hang on to the vision that the status quo was going to remain. And I feel like that's changing in my marketplace. So today, I thought, to frame the conversation, it would be important to talk a little bit about the entry level arena and the lateral arena. I think they're both interconnected and hopefully if I do a good enough job, you'll see how they're connected. Um, I thought I would also talk about where are the jobs and what are the employers seeking from my perspective when I get a job order. Um, and where is the demand? So please stop me if um, I go over my now seven minutes. Um, it is tough to talk about these subject matters. Um, I didn't see you over there, hi. Um, it, it is tough to um, deal with these subject matters in a short period of time, but we're gonna really try. Um, before I go on, for the lawyers in the room, how many of you got your first job out of law school through the traditional OCI process? On-campus on campus interview. interview. 
So okay, so so it looks uh, did, did that like most of us, mm -hmm. I would say, got our jobs through the traditional OCI process. And I dare say that many of you interviewed probably in the fall of your second year for your first job. And many of you made decisions by December 15th, I think, if I'm looking at the demographic in the room. Um, and some of you even got your jobs as three L's, right? Probably most of you got jobs as 3L. Some of you took, yeah. right. Well, throw that process out the window. Um, I have a daughter who is a 2L, and by August 15th, she had all of her offers um, in hand and made a decision very shortly thereafter. I, I feel like, <laughs> Immediately following the first year of law school, people are being asked to make decisions about their first job out of law school. There are very, very few, and I read a statistic somewhere, and we were talking about, talking about numbers here, but I saw that some 15% of 3Ls got their job as a 3L, and the rest of the people had had jobs as <coughs> at the end of their 1L process in early August. Um, I don't know about you, but I think most of the lawyers that I interact with felt they had a little bit more time to make a decision about when they were going to make that decision about the practice of law. What area of the law did you want to be in? Did you want to be a litigator or do you want to be a transactional lawyer? Now that decision is being made, like I said, at the end of the first year. So we see that there are fewer opportunities um, for the summer associate program and shorter programs. And I, I thought it, would, it might be helpful because, again, people read numbers all the time in the newspaper, but I thought it might be instructive particularly um, to share some of the numbers that I've been able to uncover um, just this week. For example, at Sutherland, Asbel, and Brennan, one of our big firms in Atlanta. In 2008, they hired 30 associates, for, summer associates for the Atlanta office. And I'm speaking only about the Atlanta office now. In 2009, they hired 12. In 2010, they hired seven. In 2011, that's just this past summer, they hired nine. And for next year's summer class, they've hired nine, and they say they're done with their hiring. Paul Hastings, a national law firm with a fairly substantial office in Atlanta, hired 21 in 2008, 13 in 2009, five in 2010, six this past summer, and for the new class coming up in the summer of um, 2012, um, they will be hiring nine, and as of now, their hiring is complete. In, in New York, the big firms, Skadden, for example, um, went from 223 summer associates in 2009 to 77 in 2010. Cravath went from 123 to 23. Now, these numbers have gone back up for next year's class in the New York firms, but they have not gone back to the numbers that we used to see. So what that tells us is that there's a shrinking marketplace for those lawyers who um, are in law school now. Um, quickly, let me move to the employment rate. That's a number that we see a lot. Um, and I would invite you when you see employment rates to kind of peel the layers off and take a closer look at it. 
because one of the things, and I see this in the lateral market, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but the quoted 2010 employment rate was 87.6. In taking a closer look at that number, 87.6% of 2010 lawyers got jobs. One of the things that you'll uncover is that 68% of those people, only 68% of those jobs required bar passage. So that tells you that they're, they're not necessarily taking jobs practicing law. Um, the part-time positions were 11%. Again, trending up because compared to 2008, it was 6.5% part-time positions. And then 50.9% um, of those lawyers reported a job in private practice. And then taking a look at wh where private practice is, some almost 40% of those lawyers who reported having a job with private practice, they were practicing with firms with two to 10 lawyers. And then finally, the last number that I will give you is that solo practitioners, are that number is on the rise. For the class of 2010, 5.7% of the people who reported had solo practices versus 3.3 in 2008. Is that helpful? So again, when you take a look at these numbers, um, the employment rate of 87.6, looking back and seeing that many of these people are doing part-time jobs, um, and many of them are doing non what I call non-traditional legal positions, becomes important. The final factor that I'll talk about when it comes to entry-level positions is the increased pressure of debt load. Um, my husband certainly went to law school on borrowed money. It took us 10 years to pay his debt back. Um, it certainly had an uh, impact on the, the decision making as to where he took his first job. Um, he certainly took a job at a big firm. Um, but at the end of the day, I dare say that in the 25 years that I've been in this industry, I've never seen so much pressure on students who have graduated with such a significant debt load. The average debt out there is um, $106,000 with an average payment of about um, $1,100. And um, if you're paying $1,100, off the top in your first job, it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult to make ends meet with the um, depressed compensation that we're seeing. Quickly on the lateral market um, front, we're seeing significant structural changes. And again, we can come back to this and discuss this a little bit more, but there are different layers now of associates in the marketplace um, with increasing frequency. We know that AMLA is reporting a depressed headcount um, in the big firms, in the big AMLA 100 and 200 firms, but we know that they have a lot more employees. Um, so we, we are seeing um, people moving in the direction of hiring associates as staff attorneys, project attorneys, contract attorneys. And this has real consequences for their future. Um, if you come out of law school and you take a position as a contract attorney and you're making $50,000 a year, there are real consequences in terms of being able to pay the debt load back. but. More importantly, the real consequence is that three years later when there's a traditional associate position available, no one wants to touch that project attorney. How that person is perceived in terms of the quality of training 
and development that that person has gotten ha has a, a real life um, impact. I, there's a lot of movement in the marketplace. On the partner level, we see movement from the AMLAW 100 200 firms moving down to um, smaller firms. And in large part, we think that's driven by rate pressures. Um, partners are seeking a little bit more flexibility. Um, there's an increased demand right now um, for transactional lawyers at the associate level, believe it or not. Um, but the firms would like to have third and fourth year corporate or real estate lawyers. Well, there are no third or fourth year corporate and real estate lawyers because none were hired three years ago. Um, so that will be interesting to watch that play out. Um, I, I think I would be remiss if I did not s uh, spend just a minute talking about corporate legal departments. I see a huge growth area in corporations. You know, most of us have lived long enough so that we've seen the pendulum swing one way or the other. Um, it's trendy to bring your work in. Um, I don't think that's that same trend. I think companies are serious about taking in much of their, um, the work that they can take in. Obviously, they're not going to do the bet the bank litigation matter or the bet the bank corporate transactional um, work in-house, um, but they're doing much more of their work in-house. So, so where are the jobs? And, and I did a little um, chart for you that's beautiful, but I won't spend time passing it out. 50% um, of the jobs are in private practice, 15% in business, government is becoming a big employer. Um, obviously public interest and, of course, the academy. Um, quickly, what are employers seeking? Increasingly so, my job descriptions that I get, particularly from my corporations, um, speak to ability to be flexible and to juggle multiple tasks. Um, they want candidates with demonstrated financial skills, finance, economics, CPA. All things being equal, I have a candidate with a CPA and one without, the candidate with the CPA is gonna get it. People with prior work experience. Um, again, that has always been at the top of the list, but it's really making a difference as to who's getting the job right now. Um, employers, I, I, I will say this for the first time, in the years that I've been doing this, I'm getting law firms and they're asking for a candidate to have demonstrated through their academic studies that they had a prior interest in a field. Let me give you an example, trust and estates. Trust and estates firm, they would like the CPA, they would like the prior work experience, but in addition to that, they're going back to the law school experience and looking at the transcript to see what kinds of tax courses did this person take. So that's a, that's a new one and an interesting one for me. Um, practice areas that will flourish and grow in the future, regulatory, um, financial services, energy, pharmaceuticals, government affairs, intellectual property continues to be a strong, a strong one, healthcare, compliance. Um, I do a lot of work for GE Capital. They have just moved all of their compliance lawyers out of the legal department, all of them reporting now to the CFO. Um, huge gap for compliance lawyers. Um, employment continues to be a big practice area. With that, I'll take a moment and stop. Tom Sager, would you tell us uh, what's hot in your office these days? It's uh, talent acquisition, and it's probably um, 
a good time to engage you on that subject. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of perspective on my own journey, but it's more about DuPont and how they go about looking at acquiring talent, both for hiring from within and the law firms they select. <coughs> Many of you all uh, certainly don't know this, but I hired in, uh, with DuPont in 1976, and I've been with them for 35 years. I was part of a very diverse class, two women, two African Americans, and two white males. And the reason DuPont decided to go down the talent acquisition road and focus uh, almost exclusively upon law schools was that they were not pleased with the quality of laterals then. You might recall the in-house profession wasn't quite at the level of, of the degree of esteem as it perhaps is now. And they wanted to diversify the profession. And so uh, I was a beneficiary, strangely or not, uh, of that program. And um, over time, unfortunately, the program was discontinued. It lasted, I think, from about 1976 to 83. <coughs> and I think it, um, it waned for any number of reasons. One of the cost pressures that the corporation was under, we went from about 175 lawyers in-house to about 120 over a 10-year period. And to the extent we were filling uh, positions, we were looking for then readily available and, and talented and experienced lawyers that had three to five years or more uh, by way of experience. Um, so the in-house profession was becoming increasingly a desired uh, choice for many number of lawyers. But again, most of the corporations out there in America are focusing upon the, lateral, uh, the laterals that are available. It was work life choices. It was uh, switching from the tactical to more of the strategic. And any number, of, the billable hour, of course, was a driver for many as well. And the fact that they couldn't make rain or weren't given the opportunities to make rain um, Cost many many of these uh, people to look to DuPont, and, and that's that has served us reasonably well over the years. Uh, now, um, DuPont and many other multinationals like us are in their next round of talent acquisition. Uh, I find this very this statistic very stunning, but it was the subject of discussion at our last uh, CEO meeting with the seven of us that uh, are the most senior officials. We will have to hire DuPont by 2015, 40,000 people. That's of the current employee population of 68,000. That's only to address attrition and some growth. And that's, of course, that's a corporate-wide number, but we find ourselves within DuPont in a very in a legal and a very similar situation. When you uh, think of the terms of those numbers, the United States will, will get a disproportionate share. Approximately 18,000 people will be hired in the U.S. And, of course, the regions where the, a lot of the growth is today, that's where a lot of our focus is on, on meeting our, our legal challenges. So um, the law schools, the question is, are they ready for the new reality? And, um, and that is preparing the lawyers for an increasingly global marketplace. Um, and the emphasis from our perspective is speed, agility, or flexibility, transparency, and collaboration. Uh, can they collaborate across disciplines, practice group lines, among law firms that might be erstwhile competitors, across regions? And that's a real hallmark of, a, of the professional we're looking for today. Um, and the world, of course, through our lens is more 80-20. We're not looking for perfection. Uh, speed, execution, and if we get 80% of the result we're after, we'll be satisfied. And that's pretty much the direction we've been taking the company internally and with our law firms. Um, so the lawyer's true value for us, both the young lawyer coming in, of course, those that have been practicing with us for years is we're looking for those that understand the importance of creativity, proactivity, business acumen, including the, being able to read a balance sheet and resourcefulness. And I'm not sure, quite frankly, that many firms understand that or want to understand it or really get it. But that's where we invest in these law firms to impart upon them. It's a new day, a new era. And if you play by our rules and embrace our values, you will do handsomely well because we're only going to work with a select few. And those that we select will get the disproportionate amount of work and be rewarded through alternative fees and otherwise with some significant bonuses and, and incentives. And I'm relatively certain, and this is not to criticize anyone, but I'm not sure the law firms understand that dynamic because I don't think the law firms have embraced it. And of course, uh, the, the focus of many of the law schools are the law firms rather than the, the corporations that they serve. So um, a lot of discussion has occurred over the years, widers in, in this discussion, uh, as to how best position their young graduates in a way that they can 
better adapt to the marketplace and respond to the changing dynamics. And it may be, as a solo, solo practitioner, it may be someone who wants to work for a corporation or work on Wall Street. But the same themes are relevant for wherever they might practice. And I think I can speak with some degree of authority, although my lens is fairly narrow because I've only worked for one corporation. Uh, but we've benchmarked with over 250 corporations over the last 15 years and government entities, the SEC, the Department of Justice, the City of Philadelphia, uh, Walmart. We benchmark with most and we are engaged constantly with what's important to you, what's relevant to your law firm, how, or to your legal department, how are you managing your, your expectations with senior management, and how are you partnering with your law firms to deliver value for the corporation. So um, I think the themes that, will, that I've struck here and what you've heard from Fred and Melba are very real and ones that the law schools that understand that trend can really make a difference, not only in terms of distinguish themselves in the minds of the law students, but in the legal community at large. Um, and so it, it, um, we've gotten this book of ours. It doesn't rank up with Gone with the Wind. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if you leave three or four, you can just go through it's a quick, it, but it gives you a sense as to how the relationships have evolved. This is the fifth edition. And um, it touches on all those elements of the relationship, proactivity, the importance of being able to do a case assessment, legal project management, and things that are uh, fundamental now to be able to practice law within a corporation. And I believe many of the law firms are understanding it and beginning to adopt it themselves. So when I look at the skill sets, uh, the types of lawyers we're looking for are those that have the ability to assess risk and exposure. Critical, critical, important task for an in-house professional because they have data and they have a look across the businesses that the law firms don't. The law firms are typically executioners or those that are looking for the tactical piece of the, of the puzzle. Alternative dispute resolution. Are they good at looking at this in a way that doesn't always result in the courtroom and, and uh, countless um, years of litigation and the cost associated with doing just that? Are they adept at finding ways to engage the client and get them to the table to understand that you can solve this problem with your cohort through mediation if you really want to? And it's not for us to handle, but yours to own. Uh, alternative fees, I think Fred alluded to that, the importance of that, being able to understand the value of a dispute and what is the true value of the services rendered. How do you develop a strategy to execute and reduce or eliminate that exposure and do it cost effectively through the use of any number of resources, including temporary lawyers. Uh, leveraging technology, a uh, big issue for us. Uh, you understand its importance in terms of eliminating duplication of effort and driving collaboration, and we'll hear that theme time and time again, collaboration. Being an effective project manager. Now what on earth does that have to do with the legal profession? Well, it, a lot, because most of what we do are projects. It could be an M&A deal, it could be a case, and the more discipline we can bring to that process through the lawyer as the quarterback, the better we're going to be valued by the internal client. Establishing those milestones, assigning those roles and responsibilities, adhering to timelines, staying within scope, and ultimately bringing a good result. And it's all about, at the end of the day, communication to the, to the client, the ultimate client, the business client. When I talk about risk and compliance, uh, we're now doing businesses and, and markets. We have not, or very little, if any, ex experience in, in, uh, in selling. And so we're re relying on third parties. So we have to be very adept at doing due diligence, understanding that the rule of law may not even exist there and bribes and kickbacks are a way of life there. So we need to pick our partners wisely and then once we're on the ground, educate our executives in a way that they stay out of harm's way. So that degree of compliance is a role that we look increasingly for the in-house lawyer to take that role. All of these are skill sets that a, a young lawyer coming to us from the law school can pick up readily with the proper mentoring and training, I believe. And of course, I mentioned collaboration. I, I probably mentioned three or more three or four more times if I could. These young professionals need to understand the importance of teamwork, sharing information, not holding information, because that's the hallmark of failure now in this society, because the pace of play is so great. You, we need to be able to share information freely and assist one another, irrespective of whether you're in the limelight or not. And it's a very collaborative team environment. And then Six Sigma, we've embraced it in any number of corporations. You have to understand the processes under which you deliver your services. If you don't understand the process, there's very little chance that you can improve them over time and drive the efficiencies that we're looking for in the delivery of service. 
I know that's an anathema to many lawyers, but that process is very important in our in our business, whether it's as an appellate lawyer or a litigator or an M&A practitioner. It's incredibly important to understand how you got from A to B. And then above all else, if this lawyer is bilingual and knows anything about a given culture or region, they're incredibly invaluable to us now. Because a lot of our play now is in the emerging markets. By 2015, 40% of our revenue will be from emerging markets. So this is the kind of the world we, we live in, and where does the law schools come in? I mentioned we started in 76 with a program devoted to law schools. I think the pendulum might be swinging back to law schools. And I say this because a number of my colleagues, the general counsel of Pfizer has already begun to hire directly from the law schools, and I suspect others are gonna follow. HP. And HP. HP. And the reason why is because we don't think the lawyers are doing a very good job of, of training the lawyers as we think they ought to be trained to best serve the corporations. So there's an opportunity there. And, and while the hiring will continue in the U.S., we're going to be increasingly looking outside the U.S., but there's, again, an opportunity for law schools who have graduate programs that make, bring students from afar and give them those LLMs because they're really positioned well to step into a, a significant role within the corporation, whether it's Indonesia, Thailand, uh, China, you name it. And you have to be mindful of the fact that the innovation driver in the world is incredibly fast. There are innovation centers technology centers, laboratories going up daily throughout the world. So all the, as, as rich and as powerful and as successful as our intellectual property system is in the United States, and it is the envy of the world, these ideas are gonna be evolving and arising from all over the world. And that, with that brings that global network innovation challenge, which is gonna again require the handoffs from the laboratory in Shanghai with the, uh, with the labs here in the United States and elsewhere. So, in short, I'm sorry if I run over Gardner, experience still matters, but it's far more easily to share experience and leverage knowledge with this network world of ours. So that means to me or suggests that maybe the law schools are where we want to go in order to build out our capability because they are coming to us without that fixed way of doing business or those rigid mindsets that they inherit in practicing law with a given law firm. And so we're looking for those skill sets. Legal acumen is a given, but maybe it's time to revisit the law schools and their offerings and those practitioners who are far more advanced than they were when I certainly graduated to think about can we develop a, a group of young, uh, uh, relatively inexperienced lawyers and have them properly mentored and leverage those technologies and those experiences through the in-house profession that we currently have. So it's just something to think about. I think it may be an opportunity for the law school to respond to that challenge and begin to those dialogues, not only with the law firms, but also the corporations, because I think you'll you'll deliver a better product when you do so. Tom, if I could interject, if it's okay, Gardner, just a comment that was made, because when I was at the uh, ACC annual meeting uh, this week, I was talking to some folks about, about this presentation and what would they suggest, and one of them actually came, and it relates to what you were saying, um, and it came from a law firm, but the idea of um, a, maybe a couple of law firms and a couple of companies, you know, collaborating with a law school to do just something along the lines of what you're talking about, a two or a three year over a period of time, where it's almost like a work study type of program where the person's rotating from the school to the, to the uh, firm, to the company, and developing uh, some experience, but also developing some skills um, that would make them wherever they were, whether they, they'd be in-house or they in a firm, may, um, ultimately make them much better attorneys. Thank you, Tom. Please give us your perspective. Uh, the time your remarks um, remind me of a, a book I'm reading. I'm working on a, uh, the, on my, on my way through a, a huge book called the, the House of Morgan and discusses the banking industry uh, basically from the end of the 19th century up into modern times, and they underwent a similar process. Um, earlier in the 20th century, banks handled so much of a corporation's affairs, and over time, more and more of that work was brought in-house, and that completely changed the playing field with the banks. They underwent a major restructuring uh, several decades ago. I wonder if we're on the precipice of a, of a similar seismic shift in the legal services space. Um, just to jump back, uh, my name is Luke Pacquia. Uh, I work at Bloomberg Law. Um, Bloomberg Law, as some of you may know, is a uh, research platform uh, 
that uh, is being built in Cleveland, Lexus, and Westlaw. Uh, my work at Cleveland University is on multimedia. Uh, I work on two multimedia programs um, through Bloomberg Law. One is a daily podcast that focuses on corporate bankruptcy and law. And uh, the second is a one on one show. It's called Bloomberg Law, where I sit down with newsmakers um, of all kinds of stripes. Uh, a lot of them are attorneys, but a lot of them also happen to be politicians, academics, um, uh, and regulators. And uh, just trying to make sense of uh, what's becoming an increasingly complicated world. <coughs> I don't think this is an understatement, but we're seeing an unprecedented structural change from our vantage point as, as basically journalists. Um, three things jump out at me. I basically call this the bond and triple threat. The macroeconomic picture is quite unclear at this point, and it's trending quite negative. Um, we got through TARP. Uh, we basically bailed out our entire banking system, um, but we remain in a position where uh, taxpayers are limiting the downside risk for our financial services industry and the profits uh, have continued to remain privatized. Europe is working through a similar uh, uh, process at this point. We don't know what it's going to look like. Suffice to say, none of it's very good uh, for the long-term economic picture. We're also seeing wage deflation across the board. That's something that's certainly uh, popping up in the legal services profession. Um, this is something that's happening in countries around the world. Uh, it's happening to all kinds of jobs, and uh, it certainly um, uh, is going to bear out in, in what we're talking about today. And we're also seeing a problem in the legal education space. Um, a lot of my programs uh, deal with uh, deans, both uh, in the United States and abroad, um, seeing real challenges. Um, debt levels, um, I'll, I'll get into it separately. And we're also seeing problems in, in the legal services space. Uh, as, as well. Um, a lot of law firms have filed for bankruptcy and no longer exist today. Um, I haven't been around for too long, but that seems like it's, uh, it's, a, it's a real shift from where we were. Um, turning to the legal education space, uh, debt levels are, are, are just insane. And uh, I think it's hard to sit here and, and tell you that they're going to remain tenable for much longer. Um, I'm, I'm coming here from um, New York, where uh, we're seeing tuitions increase year after year, and uh, salaries are not keeping pace, uh, to say the least. I graduated from New York Law School. It's uh, a couple blocks away from um, the World Trade Center. 98% uh, of my class borrowed 99% of, of their uh, legal education costs. Uh, our tuition, I forget exactly what we paid, but it was over $40,000 a year. Um, I have no friends. Uh, no, that's not true. I have three friends, <laughs> have three friends who are, are still working um, at large law firms. They don't intend to be there uh, in two years. Everyone is either out of law entirely or in alternative legal careers um, with salaries that come nowhere near uh, the point where they're going to be able to pay off their loans in 10 years' time. It's more like 40 or 50. That said, um, my old law school is also very close to Zuccotti Park. It's the site of Occupy Wall Street. And uh, there are um, lots of discussions down there from uh, kids and, and adults, and uh, even uh, elderly adults who still have um, legal um, education debt and education debt in general. And there are serious conversations about organizing strikes to suspend payments of debt. Um, you can't discharge student debt in bankruptcy. And uh, this is a reality that's being borne out on, on people on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, I, I think it does need to be considered when we talk about the, the future of legal education. Um, I have a couple of interesting um, contacts that I've met through my show uh, in the legal education space in Europe. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's a school named uh, Eusirius in Germany. It's the first private law school in Europe, um, they're taking a very interesting approach. Uh, costs are, are, tuition costs are, are, are lower, the program uh, speaks English, um, and they encourage their students to seek out, they encourage their students almost from day one to look at jobs outside of traditional uh, practice areas. Um, I can't speak to what their employment statistics look like. Um, suffice to say, graduates from that institution seem to be happy and healthy. Um, certainly happier than, than uh, my friends from my law school. Um, another interesting example comes to me totally out, removed from my Bloomberg experience. My brother, um, Thomas, uh, decided to go to a, a cheaper law school in the middle of the country 
that allowed him a very unique opportunity. They let him do a full year um, at a European institution called Maastricht. Um, Maastricht has a, a small university in a lovely town in Holland um, that allowed him to work on an LLM in international uh, IP. And uh, he got credit for his JD at the same time. And uh, he was able to meet people from all around the world. And uh, he actually ended up paying less than he would have paid uh, at his home institution for that year. So he's going to come out with a much lower debt level than I ever contemplated. And uh, he's going to have an LLM right out of the gate. And he's going to have a uh, wonderful, wonderfully different um, outlook on life and different skill sets and, and different contexts. So we're starting to see people look at legal education in an entirely different light. The traditional model simply isn't fulfilling the, the needs that it was, say, five, 10 years ago. Um, I'm also reminded in preparing for this talk about my conversation with Dean Matazar. He's the dean of my law school. We did a two-part interview shortly after the New York Times basically nailed him to the wall uh, for a lot of practices that his law school uh, uh, puts into effect. Um, it was interesting to talk to him about the idea of changing the structure of a three-year JD program. Um, I think he would like, uh, if, this was if this were to be politically feasible um, outside of his institution, to uh, turn it into a two-year program with apprenticeships. Um, I think that that would certainly immediately go to helping um, the debt pitcher for students coming out of, uh, out of law school, because I don't see salaries moving anytime fast. Uh, I think that this is a problem that needs to be addressed on the debt level. Turning to the law firm space, um, partners, firms, and, and representatives from bar associations that I talked to. We did an interview with Steve Younger. He's the president of the New York State Bar Association, or at least he was last year, um, are emphatically of the opinion that law students are simply not ready uh, to be trucked out into the marketplace and bill $300 an hour. I think everyone pretty much agrees on that. But interestingly enough, uh, rather than seeing law school shortened to a two-year program, they want more training on law school's dimes. Um, it's an interesting uh, juxtaposition, juxtaposition uh, from where some law school deans happen to be. We'll see where it goes. I know Drinker Biddle had an interesting program where they uh, were basically at least telling the outside world that they were going to put their associates in a one or two year training program where they would be essentially teaching them uh, the ropes of uh, corporate practice. Um, that said, I, I question how many associates would like to be in that program uh, rather than getting face time with clients. Um, Different perspective, I guess. Um, interesting news also at, uh, at a Bloomberg yesterday before I came down here. I was informed that we uh, took um, five partners from uh, our main um, law firm, uh, Wilkie Farr. Uh, They're going to be setting up a new uh, in house legal services practice, and they brought 15 associates with them. So it certainly uh, confirms uh, some of the, uh, the views we were talking about previously on the panel. I think. Um, I think we're seeing an empowered client base um, at the corporate level in law, and uh, um, I, I certainly expect this, this trend to continue. What else do I have? I think that is, um, that's about it. I mean, I guess the, 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 the final thing that I would leave you with is that whole segments of the legal services market um, no longer exist. When I was in college, um, I had a lot of older friends who were working uh, for white shoe law firms on um, securitization. And securitization, at least on the residential side, is extinct. It's like talking about a triceratops. I don't, think, <laughs> I don't think anyone expects it to come back. And uh, the numbers of lawyers, um, I'm not sure how many of you remember, uh, when the credit crisis just started to emerge, Cadwalder immediately cut over 100 attorneys, all in that group. And those jobs haven't come back. Cadwalder's profits are up, but that's a whole segment of the marketplace that um, they won't be in uh, anytime soon. Uh, there are also technology changes. Um, just to do a little pitch about B-Law, um, I come from the bankruptcy space. Um, firms that go out and represent creditors committees um, as, often, as little as five years ago had associates devoted towards trolling PACER, figuring out what bankruptcy cases had which creditors in there, and then they would prepare a book to go down to Delaware or New York to pitch the creditors committee and, and, and do all this um, uh, business development uh, activity, 
basically B-Law has created software that negates the need for these associates. Partners are starting to do this work at their desk. Um, this isn't a happy change, I'm sure, for a, a lot of uh, people in the legal education space, um, but it's a reality. Um, work that was previously done by um, flesh and blood associates uh, can be done with a computer program. So, not the happiest presentation, apologies, but uh, <laughs> that's the way I see the world today. So. So we've got about 20 minutes, and I think it would be helpful if um, we could talk a little bit about what a school like Emory with uh, progressive leadership and adequately funded, which we can define, um, could and perhaps should do, because that, Robert, I think that's where we're headed. Sure, that would be very helpful if you want to talk about that Yeah. So you got, you got two different viewpoints up here, obviously. I mean, you know, Melba is in, the, in a position of people coming to her saying, uh, I need lawyers like this. She's trying to find them, or she's got lawyers saying, I want a job like this. Uh, Fred's perspective is, you know, for 20 years, running the largest association of corporate law departments in the world. And uh, his vantage point is fairly well known. Um, Tom's, you know, the evolution of the DuPont legal model, it really rests on Tom's tenure. And it's been very interesting for those people who were in it, and for those who aren't, too bad. And so there, there are, you know, three different perspectives up here. And then you hear Lee, who's a relatively recent law graduate, but dealing with the significant issues that always seem to start in New York. Uh, but I think we're going to ripple elsewhere. So, uh, you know, do we have the right skill sets? Do we have the right type of students? Uh, do we have the right type of reputation for a law school to place people? The evolution is that law has become more and more complicated. The large, I happen to have been trained at a large law firm most of my career and, and uh, as many know, more recently went into a boutique law firm and I called this past year the year of diversification. Um, now I was a very senior partner at that point in my career so I had already elevated myself to a level where I consider myself to be a business advisor, a, con a counselor, a true counselor to clients. But I don't think that's what we're training our uh, law students, nor are we training young associates in the large law firms because we have so um, over-specialized um, because of how technical and large these, you know, how difficult and, and how large the transactions are that, that the firms I've been associated with are that everybody gets a segment. And perhaps in certain respects, the old, you know, litigators who, who knew that they were going to practice in multiple areas, the people who came with an MBA or a business background. Tom, it seems to me that what you're saying that you're seeing lacking is you're seeing technically skilled lawyers that can't adapt into the true world. And, and that to the extent that we're not doing that at a law school level, we're also not doing that in the large law firm platform that's producing in the past the, um, the, the really the talent that used to go in-house after four or five years. So I think that, that this dialogue is really interesting to me because um, clearly uh, part of what the difficulty is having done it the reverse way where now I'll, I'll, I'll not really consider myself only to be a, you know a commercial real estate lawyer or a commercial real estate finance lawyer, but I'm a lawyer first. And so we're kind of going the reverse direction than the way that our whole um, profession has evolved for the last 30 years. Um, and with how difficult these transactions are, it can be very scary to start to say that, you know, I can do the tax issues, I can do the business issues and the corporate issues and the transactional, you know, secured lending issues. And I think that's what you're saying, Tom. In a corporate environment, that's what most GCs and you know are doing, and that's not what most lawyers are doing until they're senior partners. There's a firm in Chicago, will remain unnamed, um, f featured themselves as prominent in real estate law and labor law. They came to me and said, we're rapidly becoming commoditized. We need help. We would like you to talk to our partners around the application of Six Sigma to the practice of law. And they were, their vision was, if we get more efficient, eliminate um, large, unnecessary work, 
we'll, our margins will improve and we'll become more valuable to the client. They did just that, no one was exempted, and now they've not only expanded the, or they've uh, ingratiated themselves with those clients, but they've expanded their representation because now the corporation has now seen an entirely different law firm. And they started with real estate and labor law, and now they're applying across all of their offerings. That's the kind of thing that you see every now and then in the marketplace. Greg Rex. Tom and Fred. Companies that are increasingly hiring in-house directly from law schools. What are the trends you're seeing and the qualifications they're looking for, and how important is class rank, and does size of company uh, determine what class rank or qualifications they're looking for? Well, the one I'm most familiar, I, I, <laughs> as to class rank, I can't tell you. I can say to you, though, if you go to our website, um, www.ac c.com and go to the in-house uh, in access blog there is a series there that was um, posted uh, earlier this year by the um, folks from HP Hewlett Packard and going through their thought processes and going through this in-house training program and what mm -hmm. they're uh, what and how they're doing it uh, that might be enlightening to you and uh, I would encourage you to uh, take a look at that. I can't, my sense of it is by and large the companies that do it tend to be larger um, or very small. Uh, you have someone who's it's a relatively, I mean very small law department and the person interned there somehow got a connection and then and then came on. But that's a that's a different model than than a formal training program and formal hiring program. Because also, for example, it implies that you've got relatively steady hiring. In our case, it, it would be um, law students with advanced degrees in microbiology, biotechnology, in which we're making a huge play. And we would, over, um, we would overcome the lack of experience for the upside, the, the potential, given that wealth of technical knowledge. And uh, we'd invest heavily in, in those young people with an eye to elevating their game pretty quickly with a lot of mentoring. So that'd be number one. And, and on the law school level, uh, on the law firm side, you find that's the case as well. For people, for undergraduates with a technical degree, oftentimes the class rank will be overlooked. And that's exactly right. Written and oral communication will far exceed class rank from our way of thinking mm -hmm. with respect to the, the attractiveness of the candidate. And can they work in a very collegial, collaborative work environment? The key word these days this day is collaborative right. and I mean we hear it over and over amongst the law firms amongst the firm with the client you know the client wanting with the firm mm -hmm. the client wanting with its firms vis-a-vis -vis each other and collaboration knowledge knowledge management and included in knowledge management is reuse and the sharing of that and not the hoarding of it and the sharing of it not only with the client but the sharing of it with uh, the firms that they're working with and that and a lot of the programs that we had and a lot of the discussion and the things that we hear all through the ACC value challenge collaboration is one of the uh, constant uh, repetitive themes I had a, a couple of uh, comments and a related question I think probably to Greg's and, and first comment uh, I guess this goes to some of your statistics Melba when you look at the Amger 100 type firms and the trend lines that you uh, gave to us all. Keep in mind, of course, that almost all of those people that they're hiring in the, from the summer associate programs and on up, as a general proposition, are all in the top 10% of their class, That's law right. review, et cetera. So you start with that as, as a premise for those folks. Mm -hmm. Second comment is, um, if you look at the boutique firms and the uh, people that are splitting off from the Amger 100 firms, uh, and, and forming boutiques, uh, what I'm finding in the, across the country is that a lot of those firms, both small boutiques, very, very high-powered ones, as well as the larger boutiques, have stopped hiring or greatly diminished their hiring out of the law schools. I could speak for my own firm that used to recruit nationally at all the major schools for years and years. We've now stopped doing that because of the, the, the cost-benefit analysis and instead are looking at the Amger 100 firms 
Now training those people for two or three years, letting them, when those kids leave, we're picking them up laterally. Point being to those comments and the question really for, for everyone, Tom Melba and, and, and Fred, is what are you looking for when you're hiring these young people coming out? And it's related to Greg's question with class rank and, and goes to this whole top 10% and, and all those people. How can you figure out who's the right person from a collaborative standpoint, from all the other skill sets that you're looking for if they're not in the top 10% of the class? Good question. So we look at law firms not in terms of one individual, but a team that services DuPont. The more institutionalized the relationship, the more comfortable we are. Then we're not dependent upon the white male who's got the shock of white hair and who decides he wants to do something else or is not available. So we look purposely at that young team and they, they leap out at you, those that are into the, the, the right approach, if you will. And it's just a matter of feel, experience, and time before you pretty much can identify those that, that you want them working on your, your matters uh, over months and years. And we'll invest, perhaps unlike some, in having those young people work on matters even though they're not quite there, they're there in terms of their abilities and, and capabilities, because we see that as an investment we owe to the law firms regardless of how, how big or, or small. And we're, we're not a silk stocking law firm user. We've got firms as small as eight or nine in mm -hmm. California. And that's the beauty of, I think, our network because we don't think all the answers reside in a thousand person law firm. You've got culture issues, you've got conflict issues. And of course, their billing model is, is anathema to how we want to operate. This is just a brief comment. I'm uh, interested in Tom's comment that they are that they will give added value to a candidate who has technical training in addition to the law degree. I'm not sure my numbers are right, but I think the number of people in undergraduate school who are pursuing technical fields has been going down rather than up. I would think Tom's comments might be worth thinking about in terms of the kind of alternative programs that you touched on briefly, Robert, in your introductory comments. Maybe we look, need to be looking at whether somebody could take a year in the bioengineering program or mm -hmm. one of the scientific or technical areas of That's the greater. university, as opposed to the more traditional now dual degree programs. Um, if technical fields are That's underserved, great. undereducated, yeah. Why don't we at least look at whether that is some place that we could go? If I could, I'm going to have to run, so I'm going to make one last comment to your question about the, or the question about the grades and things. I don't, haven't done much hiring. We're not quite in the same mode. But when I talk to folks when I would, and I would listen, anecdotally, what I get is grades are important for that first job. And they become of diminishing importance as you go on. And it becomes much more the experience and, and, and as you see. And, 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 and what you see, per Tom's comments, you start to get the feel for folks. And also I would say that so many of our folks, our members talk about how much they, they look to the boutique firms, how they're moving away. Also how they look to the regional firms. Uh, and they're not. Uh, those firms are not all staffed by Ivy League um, lawyers. Uh, and so I think there's a, the, yeah, if you can deliver value, there is a lot of business out there that can, can be obtained. And if you're doing that, they don't much care where you got your degree. It's my, it's my two cents worth. I am sorry, I have to leave to uh, catch a train. I think we have one comment from Galvin and then go to the two last comments and then. Good. Just, just very briefly, from, from a student's perspective, I'm, I'm still in school, I'm a fourth year JD MBA at Emory, and, and I think that students are ready for this kind of change. Um, over the last four years, I've seen students go from the approach of we're all going to go get jobs in big law to a much more strategic vision of how they're going to approach their jobs. But having said that, I think those students who are not going to go into the big law are looking five, ten years down the road and searching for opportunities to distinguish themselves from among their peers who do go to the big law so that they can take that next step. 
And I guess my question would be, what are the opportunities out there for people who are coming out, who are working in jobs that are, quote unquote, not as desirable as the big law jobs, to distinguish themselves, develop those skills that you were looking for so that they can take the next step with their next jobs? Well, fellowships, um, which uh, Equal Justice Works is very active in, they provide significant opportunities to young lawyers that have graduated in any number of ways to service people who are in need of representation. And I think that's an ideal way of honing your skills because in many instances you're, you're working with files this large and you're going before immigration services and the like and be able to connect with the, that clientele is a, a gift unto itself. And invariably, if you're sponsored by a, a law firm or a corporation or both, you've got a relationship started right there. And whether it translates into a job for you at there, you certainly have a reference there, reference point to make it connect elsewhere. Uh, I want to say something that probably people are going to get annoyed with me to say, but I'll say it nonetheless. There is a cultural difference between the younger law students that are coming out today than the student that came out 20 years ago in terms of their coping skills, their ability to juggle, their ability to try something and fail. Um, there is a their expectations in terms of what is owed to them by the workplace. Um, and the distinction that I make when it comes to a grade question, if I'm going to recommend somebody to a corporation, part of the evaluation that I'm making is, is this person, does this person have the coping skills to walk into an office, typically with a business client across the table, and be firm enough to, to listen and to understand and to digest but to interact for the well-being of the corporation. Uh, are, do they have those intangible skills? Um, and I, I don't think it's because I'm getting older. I think it's because there's a difference um, in, in some of these people that are coming out. And I think some of that can be taught, quite frankly. Melba, on the, on the law firm side, um, any observations on business development um, as a setting uh, for younger attorneys today compared to, I mean, I suspect 20 years ago, at least the people I talked to have been practicing that long. They say that they were calibrated to go out and get work. Um, I don't see anyone my age really set to network to the level that they can build a book of business and move on to the traditional partner track. I teach a uh, an Ali Abba course that Jeff Pinnell had started at Emory that's now up in New York at New York Law School and I <coughs> teach a trust section. Mm -hmm. And I found, first of all, I'm shocked that um, our attendance hasn't fallen off more than it has. I thought it would and it's really picked back up. This is for lawyers pretty much out of the law school environment for a number of years who want to transition into trust and estates and personal income tax and related um, individual law and so I've watched and I think this is now my sixth year teaching I've transitioned my section on trusts which is a three-hour class much more to business development because they're getting a lot of the fairly dry kind of statutory part the rest of the week and I just from their questions they had no idea who their clients might be they had no idea how to build a personal law business. And I'm finding that I'm getting much better results and feedback from my students year over year when I introduce the strategic thinking, the what are the, who, what kind of clients might you have? Or questions they'll get from prospective uh, clients calling them. And they're missing, I think, most of the opportunities, generally. And I, I'm changing my emphasis in my teaching. How receptive do you find your students? <laughs> I imagine this is like getting hit with a baseball bat. It, uh, and deer in the headlights yeah. kind of thing where they just are, but um, kind of even within the three hour segment, a little bit of 
eyes opening up and questions picking up toward the end. Yeah. Sure. But, but yeah. schools develop reputations in terms of the product that they deliver. Um, over time, schools have reputations about their students. And if I were running a law school, one of the things that I would do, and I don't know anything about running law schools, but I would find some volunteers who are good mentors. And I don't mean somebody who just has it on their resume that they're a mentor, to work with these young students on a one-on-one -on -one basis because career development is not something that you do in group think. It's not. Each person comes to the table and they're different. So you have to meet them where they are. But it takes a special person to coach a young person through the process. Uh, David, did you want the last word here? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. Follow up on, on Shulton's point because I, I think that is a, a brilliant idea. I mean, one of the things that we see are people who come to the firm and they say they're interested in intellectual property law, but they were an English major and they have absolutely no technical background. I mean, I, I think it goes to Tom's point uh, having people who have some background uh, on the business or technical sides of the job, but also to Melba's point that. They, employers are looking for people who have a demonstrated interest with their coursework. And if you look at leveraging all of the departments of the university and, and moving beyond a, an MBA program or, or some of the more limited offerings, that you could open that up mm -hmm. to give people at least a year of, of background where otherwise they would have none, I, I think that may help compensate for, for the top 10% issue. Right. I think that's right. Well, I'm just going to say, will you join me in uh, thanking our panelists for the time? <laughs>